Your mind doesn't care if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, healthy or unhealthy, it just believes it. If you can see it, you can achieve it. If you can dream it, it's inside of you and the vision board takes it outside of you. But one of the things that makes me as a therapist so successful is breaking down what's wrong with my clients. So I'm going to give you a crash course in how to run your brain in 25 minutes, and you really can do it. So I've always been fascinated by human behavior and how the brain works, and I've spent most of my adult life studying how the mind works, which is why I became a therapist. And I was very lucky because I got voted best therapist in Britain and got voted the best of the best in Tatler and in lots of other magazines too. And I only tell you that because that opened so many doors for me and suddenly I'm being flown all over the world working with Olympic athletes and rock stars. And that was great for me because then I got a chance to really look at how people's brains work. And I was fascinated by how people who've got everything have a bit of a different mindset. I had two types of clients, those that had everything and loved it, and those who had everything and thought, how quickly can I fuck this up? And it was really interesting how their mind worked. So when I was studying to be a therapist, my teacher, who was very eminent, said to me, well, he said to the whole class, the mind is really complicated. It's extraordinarily complex. It takes a lifetime to understand and a lifetime to master. And I thought, well, how's that going to work then? Who's got a lifetime to work with their patients? Not me. I haven't even got a lifetime to sort out my own brain, let alone someone else's. So I thought that was a strange thing, that we're taught our mind is complicated, complex, takes a lifetime to master. Maybe by the time you're 90, you might have got it worked out, but that's a bit too late. But I found three things, and in my own school, I've been teaching them to people who are now becoming extraordinary therapists too. So you need to know three things about your brain, and I'm going to tell you what they are, and you're going to put them into practice, and I promise you, it will change your life, and you can have pretty much whatever you want. So let's start with number one. This is how your brain works. It does what it thinks you want it to do. Sadly, it works off information you gave it once upon a lifetime ago when you were six or 10 or 15. But your mind is always doing what it thinks you want. It's always doing what it truly believes is in your very, very best interest. So if any of you here have got a habit you'd love to be free of, but guess what, you still got it? Your mind thinks, no, you don't really want to be free of that. And anyway, it's better for you to keep it. On the other hand, if there's a habit you'd love to acquire, like speaking in public, being really successful, believing in yourself, not eating junk, your mind thinks, nope, it's in your best interest to keep that habit. And so I kind of, everything I'm going to teach you today, I didn't learn from a book, I learned from my own patients. And I was told I could never have children, I just have to get over it. But I knew even then I wasn't going to believe that. And I'm very much known as a therapist therapist. So when doctors can't get anywhere with their patients, they send them to me. And for a while, because I was told I was infertile and then proved that not to be the case, I worked with infertile women and almost always got them pregnant, usually by the very next cycle, even if they hadn't had a period for 10 years, because you really can feel miracles when you understand how the brain works. So doctors would say, okay, this patient has unexplained infertility. Well, what does that mean? It means I can't explain it. There's nothing wrong with their body. They have periods, eggs are fine, husband's sperm's fine, can't have a baby. So they'd come to see me and I'd usually regress them back. And they always came up with the same thing. Where are you? I'm 17, what's going on? Oh my God, I think I could be pregnant. My dad's gonna kill me. I'm gonna get thrown out of the house. I'll get kicked out of school. Where are you? Oh, um, you know, I'm, I think I might be pregnant and I'm gonna lose my job or uh, sometimes you just go back to normal things, like saying to their boyfriend every month, for God's sake, don't get me pregnant. That would be a nightmare. And now the brain is very clear. You don't want a baby. God, no, you've used nightmare, hell, disaster. My dad will kill me. You don't want a baby. And now the brain is very clear. You don't want a baby. It's like, no, that was when I was 16. Now I'm 36. I've just spent 20 grand on IVF. I really do want a baby. But the mind doesn't catch up with you. We think we're so smart and our mind is so evolved, but it is often stuck in the past. So who here has done this? Who here has said... I'm dreading going to that meeting next Wednesday. Why did I volunteer to speak? I'd give anything not to have to go and chair the meeting, speak up, go. Anyone ever done that? Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? 
Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to chair that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I die if I've got to go on stage. I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday comes and you wake up with diarrhea and your brain's like, how cool am I? You can't even leave the bathroom, no, let, let alone go for that meeting. Who here has ever said, I'm so stressed, I'm pushed to the max here, I'm at my limit. What I would give for a weekend in bed just lying around, your brain's gone, oh, do you want the flu? I could give you that tomorrow. Now there you are in bed. And of course, that's not what you wanted. But you've got to be very, very clear with the brain. Because this is your brain's job, and it really is a specific. Your brain's job is to keep you alive on the planet. And it does that by moving you away from anything that it thinks will cause you pain. So when we were tribes people, we didn't really wander too far from the tribe. We didn't eat anything that looked a bit odd because we survived by linking pain to something. And, and life hasn't changed. Anyone here ever eaten something that's made them really, really sick, like mushrooms? You still eat them now? <laughs> Anyone had really bad food poisoning? Anyone find they cannot now eat that food that they were up all night bringing up over the toilet? Sure, because when you go, oh my God, I'll never eat seafood again as long as I live, your brain remembers. The next time you see seafood, you kind of feel a bit odd and think, oh, no, I can't eat that. No, no, no. So your brain's job, very clear, move you away from pain. So what do you think happens when you drive to work going, this traffic is killing me. I am dying in this job. My client is hell. My boss is a nightmare. I'm up going up the wall with stress. Well, your mind goes, um, okay, let me just get that again. Your job is killing you. Your boss is driving you crazy. You're up to the wall with stress and you're dying under your paperwork. Well, I don't think you should go back to that job anymore. So I can make you really sick so you can't go. And if you ignore me, I just make you sicker. I can give you an ulcer. I can give you panic attacks. That's what the mind does. So give you an example. One of my clients was telling me that when he was a kid, he had to read and read out loud. And he had to read out stomach. And when he got to it, he read stomach. My stomach ate. And all the children laughed. And even the teacher laughed. And he went bright red. And his brain starts to search for, oh, what's making you so stressed? Oh, you read out loud. You drew attention to yourself. Everyone laughed at you. Don't ever do that again. And so many, many, many years pass. And he decides to go for an interview. And his brain's like going, what are you doing? Don't you remember what you said? You were never going to draw attention to yourself again. You seem to be going for an interview. I'll make you really anxious and nervous. Then you won't go. For other people that study, they go, you know, I, I thought I could do that public speaking. But actually, when it came to it, I was so nervous, I pulled out of it. And I've never done it since. That's one group. Second group, ignore that and go, no, I've got to do it. I want to do it. And they do it under terrible duress. They're anxious, they're stressed, and their brain's going, hello? Why are you ignoring all these fantastic illnesses I'm coming up with to get you off that stage? You appear to be on that stage, so I'll just crank them up even more. Third group, they're much smarter. They dialogue with their brain very, very, very differently. So let me give you an example. Who here's got their own business or would like their own business? Okay. So when you have your own business or you write books or you speak, you often have to work weekends. Sometimes you have to work nights. And so if you're sitting at home, this is you going, oh, God, I've got to spend all weekend writing. This is so hard. It's really boring. All my friends are in the pub. Your brain's like, you don't really want to do that. Why don't I have you tidy up your sock drawer for three hours and empty out your, your emails? Because you don't want to do that work. And you go, no, I've got to do it. I have to do it. It's so boring, but I must do it. And your brain's like, uh-uh, I'm going to distract you. Because your brain's job is to pull up resistance if you don't want to do something. So it's really poor communication saying, I've got to, and I have to, and it's really hard, and it's dull. And it isn't just using words like, this is a nightmare, this is hell, just saying, this is so boring. Oh, this is, this is so dull. It's enough to get your brain to say, move. So this is how you communicate with your brain. You say to it, I have my own business. I really want to do this. I have chosen to work through the night. I've chosen to do it. I've chosen to feel great about it because I've chosen to be successful. And your brain goes, you really want to work all night? Yep, I really want to work all night. And I'm going to say, it excites me to work all night. It empowers me to work all night. It thrills me. My brain's like, yeah, I got it. Great. So instead of making you resist, I can just give you loads of energy and I can set you on fire and you can work all night because you told me you want it, you like it, you've chosen it. 
and you've chosen to feel great about it. So I learned this technique when I was working. I used to work on a lot of shows with very fat celebrities with the idea that we'd get them very thin. And one day we were working with some Marines in Wales and the Marines were running up a hill. It was pouring with rain. They were running through sheep shit. They had half their body weight on their back and they had a miner's light on, strapped onto their head. And so they're running, running, running. And the brain's going, um, yeah, this is a bit weird. You're running up a hill in the pouring rain. You've got a miner's light on your head. You've got half your body weight on your back. It's freezing cold, but you're singing. And of course, because the Marine's singing, the brain's like, yeah, well, I guess you like this stuff. I mean, you're singing, you must like it. I don't have to do anything, because you like it. And that's why people sing when they're doing something difficult. Now, the celebrities, okay, here's the miner's light. And they go, if you think I'm putting that miner's light on my head, you are out of your fucking mind. There's no way, excuse me, swearing, that I'm gonna wear that. You think I'm gonna run through sheep shit in the rain at seven o'clock at night? I'm not doing that. And of course they couldn't do it because they said, I'm not doing it. Whereas when you say, I've chosen to do this, I want to do this, this excites me, it empowers me, then you get what you want. So let me just move on to, how many people have done this? Asked, thought I want some time off and got really sick. Let's go on to our next slide. Because this is not positive thinking, it's nothing like that. This is clear, specific, detailed, precise communication with your mind. And when you're detailed, you get whatever you want. Because your mind doesn't care. Your mind doesn't care if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, healthy or unhealthy, it just believes it. So who, li who likes to have proof that everything I'm saying is true? Stand up and let's have a little bit of proof. So I want you to remember this. Your mind does not care what you tell it. If it's positive or negative, good or bad, healthy, unhealthy, it just goes in. So I want you all to take your left arm and I want you to point your left arm out like that. And all you're going to do, have a little rehearsal so you don't poke out your neighbor's eye. All you're gonna do is that. So you might need to come forwards or out a bit. So all I want you to do is everyone take their left arm and I want you to take it as far back behind as it will go, push it to where it is. Now look over your shoulder and just notice where your left arm is. That's all you have to do, notice where it is, bring it back, drop your arm down again. Close your eyes and you're gonna have a bit of amazing proof now. I want you to tell your left arm in a minute, when I repeat this exercise, you will go a third further. You are super flexible, you're like Play-Doh, you're like elastic, you're like a bendy doll, and you are gonna go a whole third further. And now I want you to see all the muscles in your shoulder like spaghetti, cooked spaghetti. So believe your arm is super, super, super flexible. See it going further and now tell it. You will go a third further, don't move it yet. See it going further, tell it to go further. Open your eyes. Lift up your left arm and just watch as it goes a whole third further when you do it again because you told it to. So now you have the proof. You can never again go, I I'm rubbish at this. I, I can't do that. I knew I'd get that wrong. I knew I'd mess that up. We're going to do another one. So stay standing up. These are all fun. So we we'll just do one more. It's nothing humiliating or embarrassing. It's all cool. Just put your hands by your side and put your feet together and close your eyes. Just keep your eyes closed. And I want you to imagine right in front of your chin is the most powerful magnet, an enormous magnet. It's so super powerful. It is pulling you forwards, forwards, forwards from the chin. Your whole body is leaning, tipping, hinging. Your chin is moving forwards. Your shoulders are moving forwards. You're bending from the waist. Your knees are locking. You really, really want to come up onto your tiptoes as that magnet pulls you and pulls you and pulls you. And now I want you to imagine it's changed position. It's gone right to the back of the back of your head. And this time it's pulling you backwards, backwards, backwards. Your head is going backwards. Your shoulders are going backwards. Your knees are locking. Your toes are trying to come into the air as that magnet pulls you backwards, backwards, backwards. And finally, it's gone to the left of your left shoulder. Your whole body is pulled 
over to the left by this powerful, powerful magnetic force. You're like a weeping willow in the wind and you are pulled over to the left more and more and more. And now just open your eyes and take a seat. Because <laughs> there's no magnet. That's your mind, how powerful your mind is. I would really love it if they teach this stuff in school because once you know how powerful your mind is, now it's your fault. Before you can say, I didn't know better, it's not my fault, I describe myself as an idiot, now you know better and it is your fault. So you're not allowed to do that anymore. No more diminishing yourself. So let's just do one more. Um, you can all see that lemon, can't you? Put your hand in front of your mouth, just like that. Close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that you're holding half of a big, fat, juicy lemon. It smells like the most best lemon smell ever. You can feel that great, lemony, waxy thing, and you can inhale it, and you can really feel this juicy lemon. Now open your mouth and cram that lemon in there. Shove it in and start sucking it, and biting it, and chewing it, and just go to work on that lemon. And of course, what's gonna happen, what's happening is that your mouth is filling up with saliva right now to a thought. And open your eyes. Thoughts are things. Whatever you think, your body agrees. The mind says yes, the body says yes. It doesn't really work the other way around. So you gotta say yes to better stuff. So how many of you do this? I just got a new PA, she's amazing. But every time I, she said, oh my God, I wanted to die when I got the job with you. Oh, this boy just asked me out, I want to die. And I'm like, I don't think that is gonna work out until you stop using that word. So who says um, it's hell in Tesco's? It's a nightmare on the M25. My commute is killing me. Put your hand up if you use any of those words or ever have in your lifetime. Sure. And you have to change that and just go, well, it's a challenge in the traffic. It's, yeah, it's a little bit boring being in Tesco's, but it's not hell because you respond to the picture. So let's go straight on to step two because it, it figures in very well. The first thing about your brain does exactly what it thinks you want it to do, what it thinks is in your best interest and what you told it years and years ago. And it's up to you to change that and go, yeah, you know, I didn't want to draw attention to myself when I was 12, but now I'm like 52 and I, I really want to draw attention to myself. I want to have a great business. I want to ask for a pay rise. I deserve it. I'm worth it. I matter. I'm significant. Because the second thing about the brain is, and this is really interesting, it responds to two things. Only two things, there's nothing else. It responds to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. So a patient rang me up last year and went, could you help me? I can't merge. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because I can't merge, I can't merge. Because I've got these companies all over England. I have to drive from London to Manchester, Manchester, Edinburgh. And I have to go on all the A roads, B roads, because I can't merge on a motorway. But now I've got to give people lifts and I can't tell them I can't merge. I'm like, oh, come in, you'll be merging in 24 hours, it's fine. But as it happened, I had to drive to Manchester with my husband, and we were driving back really early in the morning. It was still dark, and it was raining really badly, and I had to overtake a juggernaut. And I was thinking about my client, thinking, wow, what that must be like not to merge. And as I thought about it, I thought, oh my God, I can't merge. I'm halfway past this lorry. And I have forgotten how to merge, because I'm thinking his thoughts and seeing his images, and I had to very quickly stop and go, come on, you know how to merge. You put your foot down, you follow the curve of the road, and you say, I can do it. And then I got back into the inside lane, and I thought, I could wait my husband would say, baby, you've got to drive now, because I can't merge. But I thought, this is silly. Of course I can merge. But, you know, when you take on someone else's words and thoughts, you start to feel like them. So I'm flying to Spain to see a client, and I'm in the queue to get on the plane, and um, this woman is crying hysterically. Her husband's begging and pleading, come on, babe, get on the plane. They're gonna, and, the, and the staff are going, well, she's not getting on the plane, and we're taking off her luggage, because she's not getting on the plane like that. And I'm like, oh no, it's gonna be a disaster. I'll, I'll help her out. I would have helped her, and I said, listen, what is the matter? She said, I can't get on the plane. I'm like, why not? And she went, well, look at it. That looks like a flying coffin. And I'm scared that if I get on, I'll never get off. And I'm like, oh, right. Well, you know, that would make anyone scared calling a plane a flying coffin. You could call it a flying sofa, maybe. But flying coffin, that's not a great word. And so I asked her a few questions and said, you know, what did you do yesterday? And she looked at me. I said, I know what you did. She said, what? I said, you did all your laundry, didn't you? She went, how did you know? And I said, because people who think they're going to die 
tidy up their house. She goes, yes, I always do that before I go on a plane, and then I usually can't get on it. I said, look, you know, you don't even have a fear of flying. You have a fear of not being in control, but I'm going to fix it. So I was telling her this story that I took my daughter to Disneyland, and I thought we were going on a little ride that went like that, and it actually went like that and like that, and I, my brain was being thrown around my skull. My daughter was screaming because she hated it, and I thought, well, I could scream too, but that's not going to help her. So I started going, oh, yay, this is fantastic. I love this. This is amazing. I, I really didn't. I can't, can't tell you how much I didn't, but it confused my brain, and then it confused her brain, and she was going, yay, I like it too. When we got back, she said, did you like that, Mummy? I'm like, no. But I wanted to confuse myself. She goes, oh, mama, you confused me because I thought you loved it. So I'm telling this woman this story going, OK, we're going to get on the plane. I'm going to hold your hand. And we're going to pretend we're in Disneyland. We're going to go, I love this as the plane takes off. And we're going to go, yay, this is great. So I explained a lot of things. We got on the plane. I held her hand. And as it took off, she looked at me and went, oh, my god, this is like why is it this easy? I'm like, because it is this easy. Your brain responds to two things, the pictures you make and the words. And when you go, yay, this is fantastic, you have a different reaction. And she said, so should I lie to myself? I'm like, absolutely, all the time. A hundred percent, you should lie to yourself and lie. Because, you know, we think we're so smart. We think we've We've evolved, but you know, when you go up to the top of the shard, I went up to the top of the shard, I went to the edge, and my, I had to do that and walk round it. And I wasn't remotely scared, but my body was going, get away from the edge, because its job is to move you away from pain. So you respond to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. So here's a thought. Anyone here not having the most amazing success at being on a healthy diet? Anyone failing to avoid pizza and chocolate and ice cream and Ben and Jerry's and not finding themselves going for a run at six o'clock every morning? So this is what happens. You're in a restaurant. Let's pretend this is a menu. And you go, oh, my God, they have burger and fries and pizza. I love all of that. Oh, it's my favorite. An apple crumble with custard and double chocolate fudge ice cream. And you go, but I'm on a diet. I'm having the salad. And your brain's going, salad? No, 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 you love all that stuff. Last time you, you ate it, you went, oh my God, this is better than sex, it's so good. And now you're gonna deprive yourself of it. And your brain's going, eat the pizza, eat the pizza. You go, no, I'm having salad. And your brain's going, salad? When did that ever give you intense pleasure? Don't be silly, eat the pizza. So you go, okay, now you think, now I feel so bad I ate the pizza. Your brain's like, eat more. That's why it's called comfort food. Now, now I've eaten more pizza, I feel bad. Your brain goes, eat some ice cream, have a beer. So this is the wrong way to go. I love chocolate. I'm never having it again. All my favorite things I'm giving up for you. I'm never eating ice cream again. I love it. It's yummy. It's I can't have it. And it doesn't help with what they call it divine and love and celebration and hero. So the way to do it is to go, oh, look, they have pizza. Yeah, I like that. But you know what? I like being a size 10 way more. I like fitting into my jeans way more. And there's pizza. I can have that when I'm 96 right now. I wouldn't look good in my clothes and maybe out of them too. And your brain's like, you don't want the pizza? No, I don't want the pizza. I want to be really fit and healthy and I've got pizza for the next 50 years right now. I'm choosing to look good in my clothes because I'm 95. I'm not going to look good in my underwear no matter how thin I am. That door is shut. And then I can have loads of pizza. And your brain's like, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that with your language. You've said you could have it. You're choosing not to. It makes you happy not to. It thrills you not to. It empowers you not to. And then all resistance goes away. Because you just change the pictures. Instead of thinking that cake looks nice, you go, yeah, it does look nice, but doesn't look as nice as I look when I fit into my clothes. You can choose what everything means. You can choose when you got on a plane either of those pictures. You can choose what this one means, you know, is that really hell to be in a traffic jam? Well, hell is actually not having a car or any money to run one. Is it hell going shopping? No. When I was in Cuba, we lost all our luggage. We went to get more and they went, we haven't got anything. We haven't got anything. We don't have any provisions in Cuba. There's nothing to buy. That's hell. I have to say it was quite liberating, really. But you can't go to shops and go, it's hell. It's a nightmare. It's a disaster until you go somewhere else and see what it is really like. So let's come to the very last part of my talk, which is the thing that therapists find the hardest, making what is familiar unfamiliar and what is unfamiliar familiar. So your brain loves what is familiar. It really wants to go for what is familiar. And if you want success, you've got to make unfamiliar familiar. Really hard work, 
applying yourself, but most of all, extraordinary self-belief. That will take you further than anything. So whatever you haven't got that you'd like, make it familiar. And if there's things that you've got that you don't like, make them unfamiliar. If you, if you lounge around every morning and a weekend and start to go to the gym, that becomes familiar. So I worked with a lot of women on shows, and we do makeovers and make them look really pretty. And the minute the camera stopped rolling, they take all the makeup off, put their tracksuit on, and go home. And I worked with one once, and she went, yeah, I don't know what you've done to me, but it's really changed. And I met this really nice guy, and he took me out, and he opened doors, he bought me dinner. I don't think I can see him again. He's too good for me. I said, no, no, no. It's unfamiliar. You know, your dad treat you like shit. Men that do that are familiar. And now here's a nice guy. And you're just going to sit and go, I'm going to make this familiar, make this familiar, make this familiar, and make the other stuff unfamiliar. And of course, it worked. And here's the thing that I find the most interesting. People who've never had praise, that is so unfamiliar. If you say to them, I love that type of guy I got in Primark in the sale, it only cost five pounds. Or I love your talk. Yeah, but I left out the best bit. And the other person was much, much better than me. So if you do that, Here's a tip, make praise familiar. Make self-praise really, really familiar. And make criticism unfamiliar. People can say things, you don't have to let it in. So I want you all to close your eyes. And, you know, I, I worked with this very interesting guy whose parents had abandoned him, and they were really horrible to him, and he become very, very successful, and, and they got him to buy them a lot of stuff, but they never praised him. And then his dad died without ever telling him he was worth a bean. And one day I said to him, you know you're a good son. I put my hand on his shoulder. He sobbed uncontrollably for 10 minutes. And I had to say, look, let this in. You're a good son. Your dad's not going to tell you, but I will. So I want you all to think about what is the one thing you would have loved to have heard. We all want the same stuff. You're a great kid. How lucky am I that you're my kid? How lucky am I to be married to you, dating you, living with you? You're a great employee. You're great at your job. You know what you need to hear. I don't have to tell you. Close your eyes. Think of what you most wanted to hear now or 30 years ago and say it to yourself now. I am, you can do it in your head or out loud. No one's listening. Just say it right now. I'm a good person. I'm smart. I matter. I'm successful. I'm significant. And just say it over and over and over again. Because you're going to make that so familiar that the old voice is unfamiliar. And here's a great thing to end on. Studies have shown over and over again that depression is usually caused by harsh, hurtful, critical words that you say to yourself over and over again. Make that unfamiliar. Tell your brain what you want. Take responsibility for the words and pictures you use. Make great stuff familiar, negative stuff unfamiliar. I promise you, you can have whatever you like. Let me tell you my own vision board story. Some years ago, I'd written a book on weight loss and I couldn't get it published. So I found a literary agent, but in the meantime, I was so bored with waiting. I thought, you know what? I'm going to do what Wayne Dyer did, create my own audience and self-publish this book. And I'd actually decided to do weight loss road shows. And I created one. I put it on. And it didn't sell any tickets, well, about 10 tickets. And I canceled it. And the same day I canceled, my new agent called and said, hey, that thing you're doing at the weekend, I've got Harper Collins coming and Penguin and all these publishers. I'm like, oh my god, I canceled it. She said, put it back on. They're all coming. I'm like, right, OK. So I immediately put the course back on, let the people know that I was still doing it, rang around everyone, gave away free tickets. And then I had a choice. Shall I sit down tonight and plan out my course? No. I created a vision board of something like that, and I put on all these pictures of my book being a bestseller. I took the Sunday Times bestseller list and stuck it on there and put my book at the top. I wrote all over it, Marissa Peer's book is a bestseller. Everyone wants to sign this book. And I spent ages doing my vision board and it was all ready to go. And the next day I turned up and I did my talk with no preparation. And when I finished, I Google and Penguin and HarperCollins all lining up saying, oh, we so want to sign your book. And I signed it and I got way more money, triple, maybe even more than I ever imagined I could get.
and I still had that vision board and I was so thrilled with it I went home and I thought let me add some stuff so I put on a picture of somebody with a Tiffany ring behind their back. I put a picture of a beautiful wedding. I put a picture of a hot air balloon over Egypt, a cruise. And I wrote lots of things on it, like Marissa Peer is the best therapist in the world. I put it above my bed. And you know what? Almost every single thing on that board came true. I was engaged and married 10 months later. I did take a hot air balloon right over the pyramids in Egypt. It was so romantic. I've been on several cruises. Everything on that board came true. And so today I want you to have a vision board. Why do I want you to have one so much? Well, I want you to have one because they work. Why do they work? Well, you see, whatever you focus on, you get more of. If you have a needle put in your arm and you look at it, you go, oh, it really hurts. But if you don't look, you focus less. When you focus on eating food blindfolded, it tastes better. Whatever you focus on, it increases. And a vision board trains your mind to focus on what you want with an absolute belief, I'm getting it. The pictures make you think, I am achieving it. There was a study that showed the brain patterns of weightlifters lifting heavy weights were almost identical when they lifted the weights and when they visualized lifting the weights. When I used to do yoga, we'd do a yoga exercise, then we'd close our eyes and visualize doing that same exercise but being more flexible. You know what happened? Our flexibility increased. Let me show you what happens when you visualize. Put your arm out like that. I'm using my left arm, use your right one, and just swing your left arm behind you as far as it will go. See, I'm pushing mine really to the limit. Do it with me, push your arm behind you, bring it back, close your eyes and visualize your arm going much further with your eyes closed. Say to yourself, my arm is super flexible. All these muscles and tendons and ligaments are so flexible. I'm like a bendy doll, I'm like a gymnast. And now say to your arm, go a third further, you are super flexible. Say it, say it again. Go a third further, you're super flexible. And now swing your arm back and see what happens. Your arm will go way, way, way further simply because you saw it happening. So that thing with your arm is just showing you that when you visualize, you actually make something real. You visualized your arm being more flexible and you made that real. If you visualize eating a lemon, you make saliva. So when you make a mood board, all kinds of amazing things happen. Why don't we make mood boards? Well, here's the thing. You might go, you know, I live in an apartment with three friends and I'm embarrassed to have a mood board with pictures of engagement rings or weddings or puppies or kittens. I'm embarrassed for my friends to see my inner hopes and dreams. So I also have a mood book. And a mood book is pretty cool. It means you just do the same thing. You stick in pictures. But let's start with a vision board come back to the vision book. So I'm going to start with a picture of a relationship. You see, if you want love, then do that. And keep looking. See, I'm going to find someone that looks at me like that. And love doesn't have any age. So there's loads of pictures of people that aren't 25 with perfect thighs finding love. So the first thing is find an image of what you want, a couple on a cruise together a couple running a business together and just stick that up in any old fashion, doesn't have to be neat. Look at it and say, I am attracting that. That's where I'm going. Me and my perfect partner are walking along the beach together at sunset. Um, I do apologize, these are all heterosexual couples. Some of my best friends are gay couples, but I just didn't have time to find that. But I did find this. A bunch of guys out on a boat together. What does that mean? Well, that could mean I have great friends. I look at that as a successful company. Rather annoying there's no women in it, but nevertheless, I want success. Here's me and my team going out on a boat doing a team building exercise. I create my own company and this is my staff. I do recommend you have men and women in there together. Maybe it's friendship, and you know, friendship's so important. Here's me and all my friends having a fabulous dinner together. 
So you see how it is. I'm making a very generic mood board. But you can make one just about business. I want to write a book. Let's have pictures of books and bestseller lists and put your book in it. Maybe this is about you building your own business. Here's someone building a business in sales. Here's someone building a business as a DJ. That's pretty cool. A woman DJ, there's plenty of those. So you get the picture. You get the picture. Maybe you want to be super healthy. So just putting in a yoga class, just putting in paddle boarding, something I do every single day, or horse riding. Oh, run out of, uh, let me add that. That can go here. So just close it horse riding. So you see, you're getting the picture. Maybe you want to be super healthy. You could put up a picture of a great body, the kind of food you would like to eat. You see, if you put up pictures of great vegetables and look at them, you start to you know what? I need to cook that. I need to learn how to do that. I'm going to start cooking those great vegetables. So you can really put anything at all on your vision board. You can put up pictures of a business success. You can put up pictures of the kind of body you want to have, the kind of food you'd like to eat, the kind of exercise you want to do. Here's a pool. So I'm going to swim every day. Here's another pool. Here's the kind of bedroom I want to have in my house. Here's the kind of house I want to have. Here's the kind of stomach I want to have. Here's another house that I would like to have. And on and on it goes. Here's the boat trips I want to go on. And of course we all want to travel. So lots of images of having a great massage, having a lovely car in the drive of my house, having a car where I can go camping. All these places I want to visit. I've been here, it's amazing. And you just put them up on your board and then you write all over it. So that's really important. I am lovable. I am with my perfect, with my one. I love exercise. I have fabulous friends. Ignore my writing, I'm doing this rather quickly. I'm super healthy. You can write all over your vision board. I'm healthy, I'm loved, I'm enough, I'm successful. I have great friends. What I want wants me. And again, if you don't want your friends to see that, then create a book. I was just on a plane and I read about this private lounge at LAX. I'm like, oh, I want to go to that private lounge. And I thought, no, I'm going to that private lounge. So this private lounge at LAX. I would cut that out and put it in my book. And because I travel so much and I don't take my vision board with me, I have a vision book and I have images like that to remind me to eat better, to work out, to remind me to use all the herbs and spices that are good for my immune system, to remind me that I love Santorini. And you can create a little vision board book. And if you're on the road a lot, it's actually a better idea. As long as you do this, you have to, of course, open it, look at it and say, I am going there. I am doing that. I am having that. And it might help you know that Jim Carrey, when his career was not going well, but a vision board of himself doing phenomenally well, having another great movie, Oprah Winfrey, has a vision board. Kelly Hoppen has the vision board. In fact, she said every year, I don't do New Year's resolutions. Every year on January the 1st, I do a new vision board. I put out my vision for that year. I'm going to move and here's the kind of apartment I want, the kind of client I want. So you can have a vision board. You can have a vision book. If you have a vision board, you can't hide it under the bed. Get it out, put it above your bed, and look at it every day. Only when I looked at my board every day did I one day think, wow, after I got married, I thought, you know, I should kind of take this down now, but I left it up for a long time. And then I thought, every single thing on this board has come true. 
So you have to look at it. If you have a vision book, look at it, write in it. And of course you update it. You think, you know what? I've got a new vision now with my vision board. It has a glass in front of it and I don't take it apart. I just stick things on top of the glass with blue tack. I write on it in magic marker. I write on it. Marissa Peer's book is a bestseller. Whatever the title of the book, my new book, Tell Yourself a Better Lie. I write on my board, Tell Yourself a Better Lie by Marissa Peer is a bestseller, a runaway bestseller. I might have a picture of someone on an airport reading a book and I simply tip X out, white out their book and write out my book, Tell Yourself a Better Lie. I could take a picture of a bookshop window with all books in, go home and I will change that picture even though I'm just drawing it so my book is the one in the window. I took my daughter to Waterstones Bookshop in London. I said, you know, darling, in a few months, mommy's book is going to be filling this window. I didn't know that, but I described it to her. It came true. And we had the greatest joy in taking a picture of me and her standing outside Waterstones like that. And the book, the window was full of my book. You have to see it. What the mind sees, it moves towards. What you focus on, you get more of. When you have a vision board or a vision book, it makes you visualize every day. Every time you look at it, you're visualizing. Every time you open your book, you are visualizing. And as you visualize, the world of possibilities opens up. And as you see the image of your book, your speaking gig, your business, your startup, because you're seeing it every day, you suddenly think, you know what? I need to take action. I keep looking at this image of me with my own business, signing checks, signing books, getting awards. I now need to take action. So visualizing alone isn't quite enough. But when you have a vision board and see you with the life you want, it inspires you to take action. It also fires you to believe that, of course, you can have it if you can see it you can achieve it. If you can dream it, it's inside of you. And the vision board takes it outside of you. So you look at it, focus on it, make it real. If you want your own home and you have images on a vision board, you'll start to think of ways you are going to find your own home. In fact, there are studies that say that 82% of businesses who use the vision board said within a year, 50% of what was on their vision board had already become real. Think about that. This is a business person, not woo-woo. They had vision boards within a year. 50% of their visions had already occurred. And if they can do it, you can do it. Only habits hold you back. Make a great habit of making a vision board, a vision book. It would change your life just like it changed mine. Don't hesitate, start now. Get lots of magazines, get some pens. And another thing you can do, which is great, is you can have a vision board on Pinterest. You can use your computer screen as your vision board. You can use your phone screen as your vision board. You can go to Pinterest and pin all the things you want. And now it's on your computer. It should be your screensaver, it's on your phone and you can print it out into a big poster, put it above your bed, put it above your desk, put it into your vision book, look at it every day, and in no time at all, what you want will be right in front of you because what you want wants you. What you are moving towards is moving towards you. Make your vision board so that you can see what you want, move towards it, and it's yours. People come to me for everything from fears, phobias, addictions, to wanting to improve their golf game, to wanting to write a book, to speak on stage, to be the best in their chosen career. And I found that one of the things that makes me as a therapist so successful is breaking down what's wrong with my clients. And I found that with all my clients all over the world, rich or poor, young or old, beautiful or ordinary, they all have really only three issues. One is I'm just not enough. Because I'm not enough, I need more, more praise, more love, more things. And when you feel not enough, you'll always need more. 
but more will never make you feel enough because it's an emotional feeling you're trying to fix with external stuff. The second thing I found wrong with all my clients was this, I'm different. Because I'm different, I can't connect. And you have to remember, as tribes people, our whole survival was linked to one thing, connecting to the tribe, knowing I'm like them and they're like me, and I'm safely going to make it if I'm lucky. So without that, it's very, very scary. The third one is an interesting one, which is I want something, but it's not available to me. I want to be free of depression, but I've got the depression gene. I want to find love, but my dad never saw me, so I know I'm unlovable. I want to be happy or successful, but I didn't go to university. People like me never make it. And people say, well, how did you know all of this stuff? Well, first of all, it took me many years of working with my clients to identify those three things. And secondly, I identify them in myself. Number two, that was a big thing for me. I was the head teacher, the principal's daughter. I felt like the most hideous freak in the world. I go to school at 11, these eight-year-old kids would go, I hate your dad and say some swear word and I couldn't do anything. I was 11 years old, but I felt so different. I always felt different. I thought it was hideous. I thought I was ugly. I thought I was stupid. And I felt so different. It was very hard for me to connect. And I had the label, oh, you're the head teacher's daughter. Everything was expected of me and I could never meet those expectations. And then one day I realized that I picked up that belief, but I kept it going. It became self-perpetuating. I constantly would say I'm different. I'm not like these people. And then I woke up to the truth I saw more and more clients. They all had the same, I'm different, and so I'm too tall, I'm too small. I'm the only rich kid in school. I'm the only poor kid. I'm the only kid that developed early. I'm the last kid to develop. I'm different. And I realized the truth. If our greatest fear is being different, and you and I have that fear, what does that make us? You know what it makes us. It makes us the same. If your greatest fear is to be different, and that is everyone's greatest fear. The very fact that you have that fear means you're the same as me and I'm the same as you. And in that moment, I let that fear go. I erased it and it changed my life. And now I never feel different. I could go, well, I am, you know, I'm this unusual therapist. I do an unusual therapy. I hypnotize people, but I don't feel different. I feel the same as everyone. I always look what makes me the same, even if I'm working with someone who is morbidly obese and they go, look at you, your legs are like twigs. I always go for what makes me the same. And I say, you know, I had an eating disorder for years. I couldn't even keep chocolate in my house. If you look for what makes you the same and not for what makes you different, you'll find you bond. We like people who are like us and we like people who share our vulnerabilities, never trying to be perfect, that's too different because those people don't exist. So that was transformational for me. Stop looking for what makes you different, which I always did at my father's school, and look for what makes you the same. And guess what? Whatever you look for, you tend to find. It's an amazing thing. If you look for good people, you find them. If you look for horrible people, find them. Look for aggressive dogs or dogs that are like pussy cats and just want to lie in your lap and be your baby. Because whatever you look for, you find. And of course, the not enough, that was huge for me too. I never felt enough because my father was my principal and he was paid to look after other kids, but not me, I was the one at home. And so I always felt not enough, not smart enough, not interesting enough, certainly not attractive enough. I thought I had nothing to offer. And I was actually going to be a nanny because that's how low my self-worth was. Not there's anything wrong with being a nanny. I was told I couldn't have children. I thought, well, that'd be great for me. If I can't have children, at least I can look after someone else's. And then I got over believing I'm not enough, decided I was more than enough, and actually I had my own baby. It was so easy. And now I help other people believe they're enough. And finally, the final bit, it's not available to me. Well, I actually had that too. My brother, 
was a smart kid who went to private school. My sister also went to private school. I went to the not private school because I was not the smart one. My sister was beautiful and just engaging and the most gorgeous baby. And my brother was smart and I was this thing in the middle. And I really believed that what I wanted was not available to me. When I was told I couldn't have a child, I knew in that instance, I heard a voice in my head say, don't let that in. If you let in those words, it becomes unavailable. And I said to the doctor, I'm, I can't listen to this, I'm leaving. Luckily I didn't, because I had a perfect baby. I had a horrible illness, and I remember the same thing, and I'm, I'm not gonna let this in, I'm not gonna join this group of people who talk about their illness. And so it was very important for me to decide what is available. I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel special. I didn't feel significant. You know what? I can choose now to make that available. And I had to say, I am lovable. I am significant, I do matter, I have got something to offer the world. And when I said it enough, my mind said, you know what, you say this all the time, I guess it must be true, then it sunk in, and then it stuck, and it changed my life. And now I look back at that girl who was so insecure, who didn't think she was enough, who couldn't connect because she felt so different and who felt that everything she wanted was not available. I didn't even recognize that person. Of course I know that was me. I remember many, many lonely nights and lonely days and issues, but now I look at my life. I have an amazing husband, a beautiful daughter, a wonderful house in LA, another one in London. I have clients who I love, amazing friends, and I'm not saying that to brag, because when I was a kid, I couldn't even have imagined the life I have now. I remember when I got a five-year diary one Christmas, and I remember thinking, in five years, when I fill this in, I'll be a teacher, and I'll be married and be living in a little house, teaching school. There's nothing wrong with that. My father was a teacher, but the universe had other plans. And when I believed in myself, I discovered I could do anything, write books, work on television, speak on stages, meet millionaires who say, oh, I'm so glad you've come to help me. And I think, well, who am I? Well, who am I? Because I'm just like you. If you can overcome those three blocks, you can overcome anything because behind every issue, it's always going to be. I'm only going to be one of those three things and you have the power to go, okay, I always felt not enough, but it's not true now. Yeah. I, being special wasn't available. It is now. I felt different and I'm choosing now to believe I'm the same. You can choose the words you put into your head, the pictures you put in your head, even what you say to yourself. Make better choices. It will change your life. If you enjoyed that video, check out the next one right here. You can also click the link below right here for your free gift. The only thing you need to find love is a belief that you are lovable. Reprogram your subconscious mind for success. Remember, it has a job.